You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London with me, Juliet Spear. One billion people live without clean drinking water, and by 2030, it's expected the world will need 30% more water. A debate is now emerging on social media networks in reaction to comments once made by the former CEO of Nestle, who said access to water is not necessarily a basic human right. So is it a human right or a product that can be bought and sold? Joining me to talk about the value of water in today's society and whether it should be a human right or sold as a commodity is Paul Halton from the Chartered Institute of Water and Environmental Management. Dr. Ben Page, Associate Professor of Human Geography and African Studies at the University College London. Diana Isaac, Chief Executive of Two Water Charity and Darren Sable, the director of WASH at Plan International USA. Well, uh, Plan International is a child's rights focused uh, NGO. Uh, we work in eight impact areas and WASH is one of those, but we're also involved in education and health. We're involved in uh, going to the last mile of development uh, within communities. We provide and support facilities, uh, uh, drinking water facilities and sanitation facilities with communities. But more importantly, we're also involved in facilitating communities to supply their own water and sanitation um, uh, services. As a child's rights organisation, we would probably put ourselves on the end of the spectrum where we say that water is a human right. And in fact, it's been recognised as such by the UN General Assembly and the Human Rights Council in, in 2010. So, you know, we're avowedly on that end of the spectrum. We think that there are very strong reasons for recognising water as a human right. Uh, but I think there's a, a broader debate which can bring about some sort of bridging between those two two points, essentially we can recognise water as a human right, but that doesn't mean that services have to be provided for free and there are ways and means that we can uh, bridge the gap between those two positions. Paul Horton, what, what, what do you think, whether it's a, a human right or a commodity and whether we can continue with the debate and find the uh, happy medium, as it were? As, as Darren said, I mean, the, 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 the debate's interesting, but the UN, the UN Re Re Resolution 64292 in 2010, defined water as a human right and I think that was a sensible step forward because prior to that the definition of water and access to water wasn't defined even though um, you mentioned in your uh, before about the number of people without access to water and the number of people without sanitation that in itself is a real problem and billions and billions of dollars are spent annually on treating the symptoms of diseases when those diseases could be prevented with millions of pounds being spent in terms of clean water and sanitation. I, like Darren, think that we need to view this in perhaps a different context, not just an either or, a human right or a, a water as a commodity with a price. We need to value it differently. When you look at water, you can break it down into constituent parts. Water that falls on land and is used in ecosystems, etc. You can call that green water, water for human consumption, for industry and agriculture, blue water, and there's grey water which is treated, wastewater. And we need to value water in all its contexts. So equally valuable is water for ecosystems as it is for industry and agriculture as well as for people. And I think if we start to move in that direction, then we probably see it in its in its broadest context and we end up with a better viewpoint about a subject. Dr. Ben Page, introduce yourself. Tell us uh, your role within uh, with water. I began life as an engineer many years ago, working in West Africa on rural water supply projects. And one of the things that fascinated me when I was finishing those projects was that you would hand over... Uh, some infrastructure, some taps, some pipes to a community. And at that point where you hand it over, you realise there's need to make people start paying because they've got to pay for spare parts. They've got to pay for somebody to maintain the system. So something that people have never paid for before, they have to start producing some kind of money for somewhere down the line. And out of that experience, I switched track and became an academic and undertook a, a long study uh, over many years looking at uh, struggles to pay for water in Cameroon in West Africa 
going back to the colonial era to 1916 and the British colonial government states to try and attempt states attempt to try and persuade people to pay for water and into the modern era and looking at the way that people have resisted paying for water and why they've resisted paying for water so it's all about those struggles uh, for people over payment of water but in terms of the rights question i think i want to try and put a slightly different slant on it which is that i think this a uh, dichotomy between commodity on the one hand and right on the other hand is a, a false dichotomy. And so far as a right is a, a legal framework of property that applies to human individuals, whereas a commodity comes from a, a set of property that applies to resources. It's a property right versus a legal right. So you're not comparing two similar things. And I think the opposite to a commodity is better conceived of as a commons. So I think this uh, I, this uh, this rights commodity dichotomy is a, bit, is a bit misleading. And that's precisely why you get to this position where you can perfectly well have all sorts of uh, private sector arrangements, which are completely compatible with uh, a rights campaign. So if uh, as some of the uh, anti-globalisation and anti-privatisation campaigners have tried to do, they make their bid around rights, I think they're on a, on a wrong track. OK, before we continue with the, the, those statements, I want to uh, allow Diana Isaac from the Two Water Charity to introduce herself. As the CEO of Two Water, um, an organisation that focuses primarily on raising funds for water projects from around the globe, um, was building um, um, building this primarily in sub Sahara as, um, as as it is stand at the moment. Um, the, the rationale behind our um, our organisation is actually to start our our work based on the assumption that um, free water should be available to all as a right. Um, I'm not going to repeat myself um, because um, I believe in particular in particular Darren has actually covered on on the point has mentioned the point that we should be valuing um, um, water differently before we actually go into this um, debate about and uh, discussing whether water is a commodity or a right so, um, without uh, repeating myself I think we should probably take the debate forward and um, maybe go step by step through all the things that have have been discussed today well what I want to do is first of all suggest that we don't look at it initially as a commodity and say Am I wrong or am I right to ask the question, is it therefore a human right or a product that can be bought and sold? I'll come back to you, Ben Page, I think. Well, I think one of the things you can do is distinguish between the service of supplying water and the water itself. So if I can give an, an example, a quick example from Cameroon. So back in the 1940s, it was perfectly acceptable for people to pay for water that had been head-loaded from a spring five kilometres away in a little town called Tombell, small town. People didn't object. There was no objection to paying for water because what they were paying for was the person who'd done the service of carrying the water on their head over that distance. So people didn't mind buying it in a market. Flash forward 50 years and the people of that town are out on, their st on the streets being led through the streets in a, in a protest led by four old women who are naked, who are driving the government's water engineers out of town in objection to having to pay for water. So what's different is that people are objecting to who's providing the water, the fact that it's a, a government that people don't trust, a service, a supplier that's seen to have failed is what's upsetting people, not actually paying for the service of supplying water itself. So I don't think there's this objection to, to paying for the service of supplying water that people sometimes assume there is. You say it's more to do with the objection to the supplier. Yeah. If you don't trust, if it's a government supplier and you don't trust the government, you think they're corrupt, you don't think they're doing a good job, they're inefficient, and the same could be true of a private sector supplier, then you're going to start protesting and going on the streets and, and demanding a change for that reason, not inherently because it's water. Uh, would you agree with that, Diana? One thing to take into consideration is the, the power of the community when it comes to the decision that is being being taken vis-à-vis -vis, um, the water that is being provided, be it by the organisation or the government. Um, and I think um, we, what we have um, have uh, noticed a lot is that the communities actually prefer for the water once the borehole is being installed or once the uh, project is completed in that particular community and what they will do is they will say that they will pay a certain amount um, every year and that money will be used either towards the maintenance of the borehole or towards um, other uh, community costs. Um, initially as an organization we did have an issue with that and we did say uh, no to it but as we started building more projects we have kind of come to the understanding that, that uh, there, is, there is a rationale to that.
So you you say that's sort of in a, in agreement with uh, Dr. Ben Page there, really, that it's not necessarily uh, who's supplying it, but you're pen- paying for the main. You know, communities are happy to pay for the maintenance of a borehole so they can still access the water. But that's slightly different to actually paying for the actual water itself, isn't it? That is, yes. Um, that is very, very different from, uh, from paying for the water itself. And um, I would like to say that um, organizations um, in general tend to have absolute no involvement with how that pricing structure is being implemented by the community. And it's completely and entirely up to the community to decide whether going forward they will pay for, for the water and whether they will, you know, they will use the funding towards um, towards maintenance because um, one of the clauses um, of most charities like ours um, we do include the fact that maintenance is included in the initial cost. So whether they decide to use the money towards maintenance or whether they decide to use it towards something else is absolutely their, their choice. I think uh, I'll ask you Darren from Plan International you mentioned earlier that the debate needs to be about finding the middle ground between access and paying for it. Ben talks about people being happy to pay for it. Diana from Two Water Charity talks about paying for the maintenance. I'm still talking about the paying for the actual product. In the work you do with communities and finding a solution, why are so many people, do you think, unhappy with the prospect that water as a product could be bought and sold and is then put on the market? Um well, I think <clears throat> with the work that we do with communities, we're, we're less involved in that particular question. I mean, I, I think that, that heart, that's, uh, strikes at the heart of the debate about the privatisation and commodification of, of water. And communities have particular perspectives on whether or not um, that type of uh, whether water should be treated as a product. I mean, the point I wanted to make, which, which builds on, on this, is, you know, the trend in the wash sector now is, is all about understanding that uh, initial facilities need capital expenditure but to have a sustainable system you have to plan and manage and design operation and maintenance if you don't do that then we slip back to the situation 30 years ago where you have uh, well-intentioned uh, ngos and other service providers putting in systems and five years later they begin to fail so really i think the debate about bringing those two things together is about the financial flows that exist and whether government is involved in that or whether the community is involved in that and there's lots of interesting debate around tariff structures whether you have volumetric tra- tariffs in, in small utility systems or whether you have, like in South Africa, a, uh, a lifeline tariff which allows for 6,000 litres of water to be provided free of charge uh, every month to a household. But beyond that, then they start to pay an increasing volumet- volumetric tariff. So I think financing is one of the ways to go. That's one of the ways in which we'll ensure sustainable service provision over the longer term. That doesn't sound very popular to a lot of people whose reaction to headlines that have emerged in social media recently about the comments made by the former CEO of Nestle that water should be something that is privatised. Paul Horson from the Chartered Institution of Water and Environmental Management. I'd like you to pick up on Darren's points there. I think this debate also arises because people look at this as as water for human consumption versus water um, being freely available for people to use. If you, as, a, as I mentioned earlier, if you start to look at this in its broader context, you know, we buy wheat, we buy cotton, we buy a whole series of goods, and a huge portion of water is used in the production of those goods, which we then buy. So throughout all forms of water virtually we we pay for them even if we go and visit uh, recreational places be they reservoirs wetlands whatever it may be we may pay to get there we may pay for access to those so i think i think the debate should really be more about how we think about the subject if we start talking about um payment for water in a community which is perhaps water stressed and we start to look at the whole function of that community, how the water falls, how it's collected, how it's used, then I think we start to come into a a different sort of contextual debate. We're happy to buy tomatoes from southern Spain, which is arguably one of the most water-stressed regions of the whole of Europe. They're starting to look at issues related to water footprinting um, in terms of the amount of water embedded in the product and then it's sold. Is the water that falls on their land 
um, rightfully theirs. It comes back to the commons question that, that, that Ben mentioned. And how do you define properly rights and access when globally 50, more than 50% of the world's population live in shared river basin systems? So this is why I think there's a need to look at this in a broader context. It's not just about the utility provision where you're paying for the service, I would argue, not, not the water. Um, you need to look at it in, a, in the context of how that water is used throughout the whole, not just river basin, but the country, the region, and, and you start to see it in a, in, a, in, in a different context, and that maybe then raises water up to the highest political level. A lot of the problems are political and governance far more than they are in terms of what people are willing to do, willing to pay for. And you mentioned there a water footprint. Water footprint isn't something that people naturally come to think of. Is this something that you would hope that society as a whole, with more debate and more discussion and with water and its scarcity as a resource put up higher on the political agenda, people will start thinking about water footprints? I think it needs to be brought into the discussion. Um, Spain is one country in Europe that's brought the concept into its process of river basin management plans. I don't know personally if anywhere else has done it in the world, but it, it, it just brings a different viewpoint onto the agenda. It's certainly not an exact science because how much water is actually used in the product is open for debate, where that water has come from is open for debate. Water that may be used uh, doesn't necessarily mean that it's detrimental to an ecosystem. It just depends on the water and how it was used in the past. So there's a there's there's various ways to but look it, look but, at the subject. But, but it's it, it's something that's tangible. It's something it, that people can get to grips with and understand very quickly. When I mentioned the water footprint, it's because of that sort of very easily, quickly, tangible spectrum. You know, yeah. issue, and you nodded, Darren. And I think if we have that understanding, if more people have that understanding, then quite rightly, it moves up the political ag agenda, so that actually we debate water. Darren, you were you were nodding in agreement with uh, what uh, Paul Horton was saying. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think that um, give it ten years, and water footprinting will be uh, a much more common part of the lexicon. Uh, in the same way that carbon footprint has, has become. I think the difficulty in this debate is that we're trying to span a, a very wide range of circumstances and, and a lot of what Paul is talking about is very germane to a Western European or a higher income uh, situation, I think. And and we have governance and policy and regulation that will drive water, water footprinting within our own backyard, so to speak. But elsewhere, for the for the 1.1 billion who don't have access to to water, water, fin water footprinting isn't going to uh, take on as readily as it has here in Europe. And and the debate there is much more about how do you sustain those services in the ways that I've suggested. We've already touched to some extent on the importance of community, and I think local. I mean, water is an inherently local product. It's heavy. Uh, it's difficult to transport, um, and so uh, it tends to be a local product. And I think. There's this connection between understanding where your water comes from, which is very alien to those of us who live in a mega city like London. But if you live in a small village in a rural part of sub-Saharan Africa, you probably have a much better understanding of the spring or the well where your water originates from. And so it has that very local quality that makes community management and community control feasible. So if you're looking for a set of institutions or organisations who have the capacity to sustain water supplies over time, that's where I would start with those local communities. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London with me, Juliet Spare. With me to discuss whether access to water is a basic human right or a commodity to be bought and sold is Dr Ben Page, Associate Professor of Human Geography and African Studies at University College London. Diana Isaac, Chief Executive of Two Water Charity, Darren Saywell, the Director of WASH at Plan International USA, and Paul Horton from the Chartered Institute of Water and Environmental Management. Who needs to globally look at this? Who needs to take responsibility for how the world treats its water? <laughs> good, good question. One of the things I would, I would certainly argue is if you look at... Um, you look at the political debate, where does water sit? You look at the UN Convention on Climate Change, and if you've ever been to any of those meetings, all of the people there talk from a political and, ge and geographical p perspective. You know, our country feels this, and we maybe can't commit to two degrees temperature rise. 
Nearly all of those countries are there and they're sharing water resources. Um, it's, it's very difficult to think for part of the world, even within the UK, where, the, where, where you don't share water resources in, to some degree. Therefore, you need to embed this into the political level at, at, at all stages. You know, there should be a water expert sitting in the, in the Treasury, the Finance Ministry, the Economic Ministry. There should be one sitting in the Transport, in, in certainly in Education, in Water, you know, water Resources, in the Environment Ministry, ev- everywhere. I would start to embed this everywhere and I would make it a commitment that water um, resources, water management, water security, however you think about it, is taught at the earliest possible level from schools all the way up. So in 10, 15, 20 years time when we're facing changing patterns of drought, resources, scarcity, availability, that generation's informed enough to be able to manage that process. Yes, Diana. I was just going to uh, to add something. I think that I agree um, there with with one thing in particular, um, the education aspect. I think that w- one thing that has been quite surprising to us um, with our work as community is that um, everyone, um, some, someone has mentioned earlier on, everybody understands where it's coming from. Um, and this concept of sustainability and the idea of um, appreciation is very much... Um, um, I guess transmitted through to the community through the school, and so the first people who um, get to understand where the water comes from and how it is available in the community are the children. Um, and I think that that brings uh, um, us to, to a very interesting point: the fact that we um, education is probably one of the the areas where we need to to get started. Um, and um, you know, I, I will bring an example. There is an example of recycling is one which uh, which always comes to mind. Um, you know, a few years ago, nobody really knew what recycling was about, and nobody was really interested in the in the recycling debate. Um, I'm not saying the recycling and water are very similar, but you know, it, it took a, a very lengthy process of education, and the community got involved, and the government got involved, and and everybody came to the table. And as you probably remember, um, there were a lot of uh, volunteers and and people going around to schools and telling children about the importance of recycling. Um, and I think I think it's 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 things like these that we we need to really really start looking at. And um, although the government might take a little bit longer, it's, it's the community and it's um, you know it's the people that that have the power to I guess make, make the change. And um, um, I, I would say that if we go back to the community and if we go back to the schools and start talking about where the water is coming from and its importance in our daily life, um, I think we, we might um, might find the, the change in ourselves if I if I don't sound a little bit too idealistic. Well, I think I think you're, I think you're right, Diana. But uh, I think you know that that needs to be at, at, at every school globally, and I think uh, children in all different countries have different perspectives of uh, of what water is and how much they use it. But uh, Darren, say, well, you wanted to uh, come in then. Well, um, to the point of your question uh, about uh, who's responsible, this is where I think um, the human rights framework offers uh, a way to drive accountability. So the, so the human rights water talks a lot about rights holders and duty bearers. Uh, and I think that that's a, a, a useful framework in which to structure uh, issues around mutual accountability. Uh, in the areas that we work at Plan International, uh, you know, our, 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 our direct uh, interest is to work with government Ultimately, it's a government responsibility in the, in the lower middle income countries that we work with uh, and ways in which we can support and ensure the accountability of government as a service provider or coordinating service provision. It doesn't necessarily need to do it itself is one of our major priorities. Ben Page. Continuing with yes. this discussion of who's, who's responsible, I mean, one of the things we haven't talked about is asking different institutions have different responsibilities in different places. So Darren made the point about the distinction between Europe and and the Global South. But even within the Global South, there's a big difference between urban and rural water supply. So we haven't really touched on the challenge, which might have been what you were hinting at right in the beginning in your introductory remarks about where the, the future challenge lies, which is supplying water to people who live in big cities. And there it's much harder for, for kind of community-led schemes to operate. Not impossible, but much harder. And there you're, you are really looking at some kind of government-led uh, uh, scheme. That's not to exclude potentially private sector uh, companies, water companies in all sorts of a myriad of ways who, who can be involved, um, in, in, which isn't necessarily uh, a barrier to, to their resolution of taking responsibility but it's absolutely right that you know what's what's a value in the rights framework is trying to hold people to account so for example 
very quickly. The, Darren also mentioned the South African case, and the South African case is very, you know, very important. This idea of a lifeline tariff where you get some water for free to start with, and then you start paying after you've used a certain quantity. But certain less well-intentioned private companies were able to find a way to maximise their profits uh, whilst still working within this constitutionally enshrined water framework by having standing charges, standing charges for sewerage, standing charges for connections, which meant that this free water wasn't actually free at all. I mean, I think that there's a lot of uh, misunderstandings in in the debate around uh, human rights and uh, water as a commodity. And and that focuses around two things. Uh, The human right to water doesn't mean that those services have to be free. It doesn't mean that um, communities are abrogating themselves of responsibility around that water. Uh, And it doesn't mean that communities will will end up um, not paying for those services. And I think the sooner that that we move on to that sort of middle ground, uh, the more interesting consensus that we'll be able to drive across a variety of different stakeholders. Thanks, Darren. And uh, briefly from you, Diana Isaac. Um, yeah, sure. I think um, one, one thing that we need to take into consideration is that if we are looking at, at this debate, we have to be very, very careful with um, looking at, at the West and, and looking at the 800 million um, of people on, who are living with, in, 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 in the water poverty at, at this stage. So, you know, the, the debate is very, very different there. But one thing that I think we've, um, we've, uh, we, we all agree on is that where people appreciate more, they're more likely to, to agree to pay for it. Um, and it's really interesting that it's the, um, the communities in the developing world that have less of an issue with paying for water or, or less of an issue with um, um, understanding where the water is coming from. Um, and and they are they are just more likely and more curious about um, about the sustainability aspect than than we are here in the West. And maybe this this is a debate that we need to to keep on continuing. And uh, um, thank you, and, Diana. Uh, yeah, sorry. Thank you. That's OK. We just push for time at the moment. Now, close, coming to the end, I'll uh, final word from you, Paul Horton, from the Chartered Institute of Water and Environmental Management. I, w- I would argue about in- integration. I mean, Dana raises a good point. We can't look at this as a, as a Western European, a global south and all this. It's, it's, it's integration. We're very good in the water sector at talking to ourselves and very bad at talking to economists, architects, planners, the rest of the people who, who need to be involved at all levels. And we are very poor at incorporating this thinking into our education system and into our understanding of trade. I mean, in its simplest form, with water footprint, we trade all over and we buy lots of goods from the developing world. And we just need to think more broadly and get more involved in what, what all of this actually means. A final word from you, Dr Ben Page. If you, if you build a water supply, there's a bill attached. There's a bill for building it and there's a bill for maintaining it. So the question is not, should we pay for water or not? The question is, what's the fair way to pay for water? How do we divvy up the bill in a way that's just? That was Dr Ben Page, Associate Professor of Human Geography at University College London. Also taking part in the discussion was Diana Isaac, the Chief Executive of Two Water Charity, Darren Sable, Director of WASH at Plan International USA, and Paul Horton from the Chartered Institute of Water and Environmental Management. at Plan International USA. Well, uh, Plan International is a child's rights focused uh, NGO. Uh, We work in eight impact areas and WASH is one of those, but we're also involved in education and health. We're involved in uh, going to the last mile of development uh, within communities. We provide and support facilities, Uh, drinking water facilities and sanitation facilities with communities. But more importantly, we're also involved in facilitating communities to supply their own water and sanitation um, uh, services. As a child's rights organisation, we would probably put ourselves on the end of the spectrum where we say that water is a human right. And in fact, it's been recognised as such by the UN General Assembly and the Human Rights Council in in 2010. So, you know, we're avowedly on that end of the spectrum. We think that there are very strong reasons for recognising water as a human right. Uh, But I think there's a a broader debate which can bring about some sort of bridging between those two, two points, essentially, We can recognise water as a human right, but that doesn't mean that services have to be... You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London with me, Juliet Spare. $1.5 
1.1 billion people live without clean drinking water, and by 2030, it's expected the world will need 30% more water. A debate is now emerging on social media networks in reaction to comments once made by the former CEO of Nestle, who said access to water is not necessarily a basic human right. So is it a human right or a product that can be bought and sold? Joining me to talk about the value of water in today's society and whether it should be a human right or sold as a commodity is Paul Halton from the Chartered Institute of Water and Environmental Management. Dr. Ben Page, Associate Professor of Human Geography and African Studies at the University College London. Diana Isaac, Chief Executive of Two Water Charity. And Darren Sewell, the Director of WASH. They're all a human right or a a water as a commodity with a price. We need to value it differently. When you look at water, you can break it down into constituent parts. Water that falls on land and is used in ecosystems, etc. You can call that green water, water for human consumption, for industry and agriculture, blue water, and there's grey water, which is treated, wastewater. And we need to value water in all its contexts. So equally valuable is water for ecosystems, as it is for industry and agriculture, as well as for people. And I think if we start to move in that direction, then we probably see it in its in its broadest context and we end up with a better viewpoint about a subject. Dr. Ben Page, introduce yourself. Tell us uh, your role within uh, with water. I began life as an engineer many years ago, working in West Africa on rural water supply projects. And one of the things that fascinated me when I was finishing those projects was that you would hand over... Uh, some infrastructure, some taps, some pipes to a community. And at that point where you hand it over, you realise there's need to make people start paying because they've got to pay for spare parts, they've got to pay for somebody to maintain the system. So something that people have never paid for before, they have to start producing some kind of money for somewhere down the line. And out of that experience, I switched track and became an academic and undertook a a long study uh, over many years looking at uh, struggles to pay for water in Cameroon in West Africa going back to the colonial era to 1916 and the British colonial government states to try and attempt states attempt to try and persuade people to pay for water and into the modern era and looking at the way that people have resisted paying for water and why they've resisted paying for water so it's all about those struggles uh, for people over payment of water but in terms of the rights question i think i want to try and put a slightly different slant on it which is that i think this uh, dichotomy between commodity on the one hand, and right, on the other hand, is a a false dichotomy. And so far as a right is a a legal framework of property that applies to human individuals, whereas a commodity comes from a a, a set of property that applies to resources. Provided for free, and there are ways and means that we can uh, bridge the gap between those two positions. Paul Horton, what what do you think, whether it's a a human right or a commodity, and whether we can continue with the debate and find the uh, happy medium, as it were? As, as Darren said, I mean, the, 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 the debate's interesting, but the UN, the UN Re- Re- Resolution 64292 in 2010, defined water as a human right. And I think that was a sensible step forward because prior to that, the definition of water and access to water wasn't defined, even though um, you mentioned in your uh, before about the n- number of people without access to water and the number of people without sanitation. That in itself is a real problem, and billions and billions of dollars are spent annually on treating the symptoms of diseases when those diseases could be prevented with millions of pounds being spent in terms of clean water and sanitation. I, like Darren, think that we need to view this in perhaps a different context, not just an 